thing ever, funniest thing ever. Every time I think about this, I laugh. Me and me and Glenn were talking about it a little while ago. An angel of the Lord appears before him. Pastor, this, I don't even know, this is an angel of the Lord, you know, bright, shining light, the whole thing. And he looks at him and says that your, your wife is going to have a son, and you're going to name him this. And immediately he goes, but she's old. <laughs> Gabriel, I believe, that probably did one of the same things that Jesus did right here. He's like, bro, <laughs> I am Gabriel. I stand in the throne room with God. I am Gabriel that's telling you this. And he's like, I don't get it. I don't, just, uh, I don't understand. Mary's like, hallelujah. I will do it. And then you look at the life. So the birth is one of the, the specific points. I don't have time to, to, to unpack all of these. That's why I'm giving you this to, to kind of read over because it will give you fresh revelation of the gospel message, okay? So the birth. Look at Luke 3. Kind of study that. That's what I was just talking about. Luke 2 and Luke 3. Then look at then look at the life of Jesus. Oh, we could spend all day on the life of Jesus. We could spend all day. One of my favorite stories is when I don't know how they did it, but Mary and Joseph are on their way home, and they get like like I've been to Israel. They were pretty far away from it, and then they go, "Oh, where's our kid?" <laughs> kind of like me at Walmart when my kids were little. They hide in the clothes racks, and I would like, brother, I would be like, "Where'd they go?" Then they go back and they find him. He said, would you not think that would be about my father's business? <laughs> I mean, it's believed that he was like 10 years old here. Teaching in the temple. Amazing stuff. And then, and then one of my favorites too is the wedding of Cana. I, I love the wedding of Cana. Because that's when the gospel is really, really, really portrayed. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of what a purification pot is. But a purification pot is when, when you go, they still have them to this day, when you go into the temple or when you go into a house, there's two large water pots. And because at one time everybody was barefoot or everybody was in sandals, they would wash their feet off before they entered into somebody else's house or they entered into the house of the Lord. It was out of reverence. So they would do that and then they would enter in. So at the wedding of Cana, at this big venue they had, they had in front of each one of the doors, they had purification pots. So you would walk in and you would wash your feet off. But all of that filth and that gross, nasty, road hazard stuff would wind up in that pot. So when Jesus, they ran out of wine and Mary came running up and said, would you do something? I love this next part too because then she turns around and I he thought they trademarked it but Mary's the one that said whatever he tells you to do just do it. So, so, so they're running and he says bring me those two pots. He was pointing at the purification pots. I'm sure everyone in the room was probably like what? They bring it over and he says fill them up. I want them so full of that filth because you're not going to see what I can really do unless they're full. Fill them up. He fills them all the way up and then turns the dirtiest, filthiest, most disgusting thing you could ever see into the purest wine. It's a symbol of our salvation. It's a picture of what He does to us. We're full of junk sometimes. Come on, somebody. I'm not going to... Listen, we've got brokenness in us. We're full of all kinds of stuff, but he doesn't care about the field because he's fixing to transform the whole thing. So these are part of the life of Jesus. Then we get into, whew, then we get into the death. And this is where I want us to take a fresh glimpse real quick. I want us to think about this. You can even close your eyes and imagine it because the, the, the book of Isaiah says that he will be marred more than any man. Most of us have no idea what that means. It means he will be beaten worse than any man has ever been beaten, has been beaten up to today, or ever will be beaten again. I don't know, some of us guys in this room, I nobody in this room ever been in a fight, right? Nobody? <laughs> so th there's, some, there's, some, there's some people, I'm just being real right now, there's... Back in the day, 
I, I was one to go toe to toe. It didn't matter. There were some times where I was the person standing up going, uh huh. And there were some times where I was going, oh, me. <laughs> Being the one laying on the ground. But, so I, I've, had some, I've had some pretty brutal experiences. But he was beaten worse than any man has ever been beaten or will ever be beaten again. I heard, I know this is kind of grotesque to look at it, but man, you've got to get the whole thing in you. Because the gospel is not far away. It's up in your face. It's personal. It's in your space. It wants to be there with you. When he was beaten, it is rumored, it's not rumored, it's been a scientific fact, it's been proven, that he had, or historical fact, sorry, uh, that he was looked like hamburger meat walking. They would take this thing, many of us know it as the cat of nine tails, it's actually called a catabellum. They would take him, whenever, whenever Pilate said, hey, go scourge him, they took him, oh yeah, I'm going there, I'm going there. I know there's kids in here, but they got to see it too, they got to understand too, oh, yeah. about what he did. So they go in this, they go into this area for scourging. So you got to imagine this in your, in, in, your, in your imagination. They walk into this room. They brought the Messiah, the Lamb that had never sinned in his life. And they put him on a stump. And then they had a whip that had pieces of bones and, and, and fragments of... And they began to... What they would do, they wouldn't whip him like this. They would whip and they would let it stick in and then they would pull to where they ripped flesh every time they did it. And then when they thought that, then when we thought he couldn't take it anymore, they looked and said, He was whipped and beaten in places that men should never be beaten. His flesh was hanging off of him. It's, it's rumored when he went down the Via Della Rosa, which is the hill all the way to Golgotha, the, all the way to the mountain, when he went down there, when he walked through that, it, 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 it's believed that he had lost over, 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 a little bit over half of the blood in his body. When you begin to lose blood, you get weak. So he's beaten more than any man has ever been beaten. He's lost most of the blood. And you know what he's thinking? He's, got, he's carrying his cross. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, you've got to make it personal. This is the part of the gospel message. I'm going to tell you right now, he was thinking of Pastor Billy Russell. He was thinking of Russell Wood. He was thinking of each one of us individually. It wasn't that he was saying, i got to get there to die. It was him saying, i got to get there to die for all of them. And he's moving and he's walking and moving and walking. And then they get to the hill. Oh, they get to the hill. And he begins to, he begins to turn over. What a relief. You know, action of the Christ. But, but there, there's even a moment in that movie where he takes a deep breath of light and relief. As they lay him down on the cross. And then, and then I want you to hear this because a lot of us see pictures of nails here. It's not where they put them. They put them here. In between the radius and the ulna bone, there's a radial nerve. One of the most excruciating nerves in the body. And they laid him down and they hammered spikes about eight, eight to ten inches long. Into here and then into here. And then they took his feet and they put his feet on top of each other. There's another main nerve called the pedial nerve. I don't know if I got any nurses in here, but you can back that up. There's a pedial nerve, and they, they ran that spike through the pedial nerve to where it didn't matter what position he made or, 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 or how he tried to move his body, he couldn't, he couldn't escape pain. He couldn't. And then when they stood him up, they dropped him in this hole. The hole's, the hole's believed to be about three and a half feet deep. So when they, they stand him up, they just let go. So all of that weight slams down. Immediately, his shoulder blades. Now listen, listen, I'm a love preacher, so hear me on this though, okay? But we've got to understand the full gospel before we can go hard after loving people because we'll actually realize what he did to save us. Immediately, his shoulders were dislocated. So all he could do is he could push up on that nerve 
up enough to where he could get a breath because he was the real the real way that the cross will kill you is asphyxiation to where you can't breathe. So they push up on there and he's got he's, he's got all that pain and he's shaking and trembling. And he's got all that pain on that on that on that nail and he's just coming up enough to go <gasps> and then drop back down again because he couldn't take the pain anymore. But as soon as he dropped back down with his shoulders being dislocated it put pressure on his chest and he couldn't breathe again. Yet, on that cross, people were spitting and mocking, and yet in the pain that he was in, the very words out of his mouth were, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive my people. Father, forgive their doubts. Father, forgive you know, their sin. Father, forgive them. Forgive them, Father. He cried forgiveness. He cried mercy. Even when he could have said, let's start over, Father, and destroy this earth. There's an old hymnal said that he could have called 10,000 angels to come in and say, let's do, let's do it. Do over. Let's start the whole thing. But yet what he chose to do is pour out mercy on justice. So he gets up there. The hour, the hours go by, and then finally, one of the most famous things that has ever happened is he cries out, "Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani?" My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew going in. I want to, I want to tell you, the victory at the cross didn't begin at the cross. The victory at the cross began the night before in the garden. Whenever Jesus said. I would love for this cup to pass away. How many of you have ever been in that place in your life where you're like, I really like this stuff. You know, the Lord's told you to do something and it's uncomfortable. It doesn't fit. It doesn't make you feel good. So you, you say, I wish this cup would pass away. But then he goes, wait, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, Father. He demonstrated right there that True obedience begins with courage. Yes. He demonstrated to us men what a real man should be like. Amen. Obedient to the one and then courageous in his all right, all right. They take him down off the cross. You know, he, he had said that, you know, he, the scripture says he had given up the ghost. Joseph of Arimathea came up, begged for the body. They gave him the body. They put him in Joseph's tomb. Well, they thought that was it. Put a seal on the, on the, on the boulder that was in front. It, it's believed, Scripture uses a, a, a legion. So it's believed that's to be, that's thousands of people. So we like to, we like to visualize there's two little soldiers standing in front of the thing. There's, there's like all kinds of soldiers trying to keep him inside that tomb. Man. Every soldier in earth and every soldier in hell could have tried that, that, that three days later. But after he went down and took the keys, he came back up on that third day. And we like to talk about the, we like to, the gospel is just the cross, but with no resurrection, there is no finished work. So God, I like to imagine, I like to imagine that day on the cross. I like to, this is just my imagination running with me, guys. I hope that's okay. I, I like to imagine, you know, because death is, is described as, as uh, on, a, on, a, on a dark horse, right? Right? Scripture and Revelation talks about it. Um, and I like to imagine death was running at him that day. As soon as he bowed his head and said, it is finished, and gave up the ghost, I bet Satan was there that day. I'm telling you, I believe he was like, look what happened. You sent another man. You sent a second Adam, and he fell just like the other. He fell just like the others. But then all of a sudden, I bet in the spirit, when Jesus popped out, he was standing there. I can imagine that horse riding towards him like he thinks he's going to grab him. And then Jesus pops out and chases him all the way back to hell. Takes those keys. 
frees the ones that are captive. Three days later, pops back up from the grave. And I love this. I love... How many of you ever heard this, what a folded napkin represents in John 20? Well, I'm going to tell you if you don't. In Israel, actually just about anywhere you go, it's kind of a, if you're eating at a table, if you're, gonna, if you're done, you wad it up and you put it in your plate. But if you're going to come back, if you're going to the bathroom or somewhere else, you fold it and you set it. In John 20, it says, and the face napkin was neatly folded at the head. Even then, Jesus says, oh, I'm coming back. When Mary had gotten to the tomb and looked in the tomb, there was two angels in there. And the way that the angels were sitting, get this. They were sitting on the, where Jesus' body was laid, and they were both turned this way. It was the mercy seat. And the blood of Jesus was all over it. Then he comes back. He visits with the disciples. Even his own disciples were like, huh? You know, you, funny story about Peter. You, you would have thought the first time when the Lord bid him to come onto the water or come out, you know, some random guy just walks up and goes, throw your net on the other side. You would have thought he would remember the second time when this guy goes, throw your net on the other side. And then it's, he says Peter didn't even, he just jumped in the water. By the time he got up there, Jesus is making him fish for breakfast and visiting with them and talking with them. So he, he visited with the disciples and showed the disciples, yes, everything I told you came true. When I said that in three days God would rebuild the temple, it's true. It stands before you right now. Then the ascension happened. And get this, historically, you guys need to know this. Historically, there are Roman documents that say that there is over 500 eyewitnesses of the ascension. And one of the, first, uh, one of the last things is the return. Where are the preachers that preach the return of Christ again? Where are the preachers that, pre that preach the urgency of the hour? Where are the preachers that preach, that preach repentance once again? Because you can't have the birth without talking about the return. It's all part of the gospel message. Scripture says he's going to come back like a thief in the night. I don't know about you, but I've never planned on having a thief come in. So you don't know. You can walk out that door. The Bible is full of promises, but do you know one thing it doesn't promise? Tomorrow. It doesn't promise tomorrow. Tomorrow is not promised. Whether you, whether you die here on earth or that eastern sky splits wide open and the Son of Man comes full of glory and says, come up hither. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Man, this is the real deal. So Nicodemus didn't know what he was asking. And I'm sure, I'm going to be honest, I bet Jesus was like telling him all of this stuff. He was just like, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. It all starts here. You've got to be born again. You have to be born again. This, this message is twofold. This message is number one. If there's someone in this room that's not born again, Scripture says, and I believe it today, I claim it like my, my, my pastor friend said over there, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. But the second thing is, you all are going to leave here today, and you're going to encounter people all along the way. You're going to encounter people everywhere you go. Whether you go to the restaurant, whether you go to the neighborhood, whether you go to the house, whether you need to get some gas. It's a proven fact you're going to see people. Are you an ambassador? That's the question. If Jesus, if Jesus himself was here right now, I know one question that he would ask all of us is, I believe this, have you been an ambassador? Have you been preaching the gospel? I, Pastor was talking about some preacher wannabes. I wish everybody in here would be a preacher wannabe. Second Timothy talks about to, to do the work of an evangelist. Now, everybody in here may not think they're an evangelist, but everybody in here, you're to do the work of one. What does that mean? There's not a friend, there's not a family member, there's not a co-worker that's safe from this gospel. Because it's burning inside of you, and it's got to get out. You can't control it. You can't control it. 
that's in you. So I think there's some people that are waiting for the radical call. They're waiting for someone to say, you know what? I think there's people in this room right now that you want, you are an evangelist. You actually have been called to be an evangelist, and maybe you've never surrendered. You remember a church camp pastor? Back when they would preach the gospel, and then they would they, they, they would they would preach, you know, every night of the week, but usually the last night of the week, this is what they would say. Who in here feels called to be full time for the Lord? Who in here feels called into ministry? Who in here, as I'm speaking this message right now, just like what happened with Elizabeth, when 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 John began to jump, because he was the forerunner. So he began to jump. Is there something in you right now that's jumping and leaping? And this gospel message is in your very DNA. That's the second people group I'm talking to. Let's all stand for just a second. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask, we went through like a fast forward, drinking through a fire hydrant message on the gospel. But I think you get the gist of it. You know, here's the part about the gospel message that intrigues me. He didn't even know if we would say yes. He went through all of it. And didn't even know if you or me or the person you're standing next to would even say yes. And I believe he would do it all over again if he 